Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. It's time for us to take you through the pages of our national dailies. We call it uh, the news of the press. Of course, it's a newspaper review. And we have joining us in the studio this morning, Emeka Madu Nago. It's good to have you join us as a public affairs analyst. We also have uh, joining us uh, via uh, phone, uh, J.D. Johnson, Chief uh, Lecturer at Nigerian Institute of Journalism. Good morning to you, J.J. Good morning, Mercy. Good morning, Justin. And good morning, Jamaica, my friend. Yes, long time. And good morning, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the leadership newspaper. Uh, we'll start off with the leadership. We need state police to tackle security challenges. Former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, Ulushagun Obasanjo, is quoted on that and was part of a top trending conversation. Underneath, as President Muhammad Buhari orders security chiefs to rescue all abducted Nigerians, asks them to sit up. I mean, it feels like we have been going through this uh, instructions. The president has summoned, the president is shocked, uh, having meetings, but that hasn't really translated to actual results. We won't shift 2023 elections over insecurity. INEC has actually uh, stated that feels like they're having uh, you know, two sides of the divide. Strike, you have the ACF offers to mediate in federal government as to dispute. Aisha Buhari hosts presidential aspirant to, uh, you know, breaking of the fast, bars use of phones. Flood, FCTA demolishes 400 houses in Guarimpa, that's in Abuja. And uh, just before we move away from the leadership this morning, autonomy, local governments are not governor's pot of soup. Hmm. That's what, how, how the label says it. I mean, it really sounds very, very interesting. But these are the headlines this morning on the leadership newspaper. All right, we'll move on next to the nation newspaper. The lead story on the nation this morning, Buhari, or there's a rescue of hostages with kidnappers. Uh, with uh, two writers there, NSA, uh, why we are not deploying technology. Obasanjo, OK, State Police dismisses community policing. 2023, 1 million INEC officials for 176,846 polling units. PDP APC clash over 100 million naira nomination fee. Boko Haram kills 12, raises school buildings. IG's hometown attacked. Nakhon allocates 33,976 hatch slots to states and FCT. US OK's drop box service for Nigerian students. And just on the red strip below, Jonathan's posters flawed APC secretariat. IG vows to uh, deal with killers uh, of policemen. Those are most of the stories on the front page of the Nation newspaper. Uh, let's move away from the Nation uh, newspaper this morning. We'll take a quick look at uh, the Punch newspaper. Now, on the Punch, I need to spend 239 billion naira on poll materials, presidential runoff. That's boldly written there. INEC always prepares for runoff. First presidential bailout may not produce winner, a uh, wreck is quoted. Electoral Commission budget, $5.39 per head. Projects 100 million voters in 2023 elections. 10 items constitute 78.44% of 305 billion naira budget. Insecurity cannot stop polls, uh, the chairman is quoted to say. Now, these are the writers underneath the caption. PDP extends sale of farms for time, was APC chieftains. Aisha Buhari invites Atiku uh, Bola Akhmad Tunubu, and you also have uh, Vice President Yemi Osibajo, Saraki orders. High food prices will continue in Nigeria order sale 2023. The International Monetary Fund is quoted. I'm I'm sure there might just be an interest. Uh, Reps alleges cover-up on refineries and summons uh, carry orders. 
And just before we move away from the Punch newspaper, state police better way to tackle insecurity. The former Vice President Olushigun Obasanjo is quoted on that. And uh, I take this one. Buhari orders rescue of abducted train passengers, says NSA. Uh, there are several interesting headlines here, but for the want of time, we'll probably just take one and move away. Excuse on Joshua Darie and Jolly uh, Pardons is lame. CSO tackles the presidency. These are some of the headlines on the Punch newspaper this morning. Almost all the papers are leading with insecurity as their banner headlines are. To the Daily Independent, it captions it this way. Insecurity, state police now a better option, or Basonjo. Uh, just below the pictorial there, Buhari asks security agencies to rescue abducted victims. Terrorists attack Yobi town, Q22, burn schools. IGP decries attacks on police facilities in Southeast, rejects operation. APC 100 millionaire presidential form bias should be probed or form bias should be probed. That's um, according to Yochayu. Uh, more Nigerians are getting mad. Red Cross, wow, that's shocking. Red Cross cries out. Lassa fever claims seven percent in Kogi State above the masthead. Nigeria IMF disagree again on exchange rate management. All right, and there's also a story on Google there. Uh, those are the main stories, but just before we leave it, we will conduct 2023 elections despite insecurity that's um, attributed to the INEC chairman. Those are all of the stories on the front page of the Daily Independent newspaper this Friday morning. All right, uh, let's uh, get straight to the crux of it this morning. We start off with the, we need state police to tackle security challenges. The former president is quoted. We have Maduka in the studio. Uh, Amika, I beg your pardon. Yes, uh, how do you... Yes. <laughs> it's good to say Maduka. How do you react to this? Well, interesting um, headlines. Uh, it's surprising that uh, president, uh, that ex-president Olusegun Obasanjo has suddenly woken up to the idea of state police, something that he vigorously kicked against. I mean, it's it only shows you that our leaders... Um, don't take, I mean, the, the, the distance, they keep a distance, you know, from the people. There's a, there's a, there's a kind of dissonance, disconnect. disconnect, dissonance, call it whatever, between them and the people. Why they live in that cocoon, you know, they, they, they put themselves, they hide in a bubble and they just ignore the challenges, the pressing challenges. The same Obasanjo, when uh, Mbad Nuju, set up Bakasi boys in Anambra. He could have called him and said, okay, this is a good idea. Well, how can we make these things better? You kicked against it. When Tinubu was governor of Lagos State, you withheld local government funds. But around that time, Tinubu set up LASMA, set up, um, set up other uh, Kai and the rest of them. All these things were to help the regular police to keep the society sane and orderly. But what did you do? You did all you could to frustrate them. Now you're talking about state police. Well, the horse has left the stable a long time ago because state governments, some state governments actually have set up things that look like um, state uh, police. Yes, uh, like, like state police. Like in Lagos, you have uh, the neighborhood uh, LNSC. You have, um, in Anambra State, you have the Anambra Vigilante Services. You have, in Ogun State, you have Vigilante Services of Ogun State, in different places you have some of these things. But the point is, you've seen the Attorney General Malami fighting against states, trying to set up such outfits. Look at what he did with Amoteku. Look at, so, you see, we must entrench true federalism, the practice of true federalism in this country. We, we have to stop joking about it because you just, continue to pretend that with the federal police, with civil defense, that everything will go well. But there's a limit to what these people can do. Then the same person just talking about dismissing community policing. How do, you, how do you operate state police without community policing? In the United States, you have the county police, you have police at different levels in different countries. So People don't just move into, uh, these criminals are not uh, ghosts, these terrorists are not ghosts, bandits are not ghosts. When they move around, people see them. But the people have to, 
they have to have confidence in the security agencies that if they volunteer information, that it will not be passed on to criminals who will turn around to come and kill them and destroy their properties. That is the major problem. These security services need to be purged. You see that all this crime, banditry, and the rest of the terrorism persists is because there are people who have seen this thing as a business and that it must continue. You see the president saying that uh, security, that the service chief should, should sit up. What kind of uh, counsel is that? Is he telling them to do their jobs? Does your management beg you to do your job? Do, I mean, do my, do, my, do my wife and children beg me to be a responsible father? You see, it is unfortunate. We have leaders who don't want to be responsible. All right. Well, let's get um, G.D. Johnson's um, comment uh, concerning that because uh, almost all the news uh, papers this morning uh, uh, took that particular caption as their lead story. What's your um, position, what's your uh, take on this? Uh, uh, we need state police to tackle security challenges that um, the former president, Olusegun Basanjo, is saying in the wake of uh, the regional uh, security network, Amotek and the Ibubediki in the southeast. So what, what ex how exactly do you reason all of this, G.D.? It's only a fool that does not change his mind over time. Every one of us and those listening to us, I'm not sure the view they held 20 years ago is the same view they are having now, 20 years after, with respect to some certain thing, with respect to some latest information. And nation grows over time, developmentally. Jide, are you there? We seem to be having an um, uh, audio connectivity issue with Jide. We'll try and uh, reconnect uh, with him. Uh, there are other stories uh, that uh, we should look at. Uh, Mika, let's talk about uh, the vice, um, the president's wife, Aisha Buhari, uh, who is in the news, and uh, she has invited the um, presidential aspirants to iftar, you know, and there is uh, more like a clause there. Uh, or provisor, if you if you may, uh, he and she is uh, asking them not to come with their mobile devices. What does that? What does all of that tell you? Yeah, of course, uh, it tells you that she wants to discuss certain things that she wants to keep private. But I wonder, first of all, there is no office of the first lady. Mm -hmm. Even President Muhammad Buhari made that a campaign a campaign uh, promise that. There wouldn't be that he wouldn't have, a, you know, he wouldn't operate, allow the office of a first lady to operate. But now we see aides appointed for the first lady. We we'll see all kinds of things around the first lady. We we'll see activities that are unconstitutional around the office of the first lady, be that as it may. Now, stretching it to the point of inviting presidential aspirants to a meeting, I, I, I think. I think the thing is that some of these are leaders, they take the people for granted. They, they take their powers. They take whatever powers they assume they have, you know, whatever influence they assume they have. They take them, they take them too far and they think Nigerians are, are, are foolish or stupid. On what basis is she inviting presidential aspirants? Is it to tell them not to run or to tell them that, okay, we have this, the husband was saying on Wednesday that there, there won't be consensus. Are you not trying to tell them that there will be consensus? All right. And her husband belongs to the APC. Why are you inviting presidential aspirants from PDP, ADC, SDP? And why? What's your business with them? It, the people, the presidential aspirants right now should be talking to members of their parties, to delegates of their parties who will vote in primaries in the next one month, not attending some funny kind of meeting. I think they should all boycott it because it's, it's ridiculous to say, where is she going to get the phones to host those people? I say they should not come with their phones. shows that there is a lot to it than meets the eye. They should just ignore that if, the, if she has anything to do. Maybe something in the public, maybe that has to do with women, the girl child and all that. You organize a conference, an open conference, and then invite them. Let Nigerians attend. Let journalists be there. Let people see what you have to tell them and let people also hear them. But inviting them into the closet, I think they should just reject it. It's, 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 is it's unacceptable. All right. Uh, let's hope we have G.D. Johnson back uh, via phone. G.D. Johnson, are you with us? Unfortunately, uh, we're unable to connect with G.D. Johnson, but we're back to you now in the studio. And uh, on the Punch newspaper, you have IMF. I mean, the IMF has been speaking recently about Nigeria. They're very concerned. They keep speaking about Nigeria. <laughs> Well, and I'm wondering why. You know, the yeah, question is why. Well, Nigeria is, a, is, Nigeria is a big stakeholder in Africa. So, okay. And in sub-Saharan Africa and among 
developing nation. So attention must be focused on Nigeria. Mm. Now, so yesterday, uh, one of the concerns for the IMF was that uh, the issue of subsidy was on the high. I mean, it would actually not lead the economy. It was bad for the Nigerian economy at the end of the day. Now, today, we're also having this report saying that high food prices will continue in Nigeria orders in 2023. This is according to your report from the IMF. And how do you react? And why do you think, okay, you've actually mentioned that, but it's okay to go ahead. Constantly, yeah. the IMF seemed to be very interested in Nigeria. Is there something we don't know? Apart from being development partners, partners in progress with Nigeria, I think the IMF and World Bank also overreached themselves. Because we don't, you see, we that tag, developing nation, makes us feel we can just take instructions from anywhere. Yes, the fact that we go to them to ask for loans and all of that, these are things we are going to pay back. We are not asking for... Uh, but, but the, the, the problem there, the mix there, is that we continue to ask for aid, for grants, even for things that are within the ability and purview of the government. So IMF feels it can dictate. To, does IMF dictate to the US? Does IMF dictate to other countries, to, to, to so-called developed nations? No. But the point is, telling us that uh, food prices will remain high, it's just like preaching to the choir. We know. We know what the problems <laughs> are. We know what the problems are. For years, it's uh, been about bad roads, insecurity, a lot of now, a lot of farmers have fled, have left their farms. Look at a place like um, Shiroro in Niger State. That is the that's where banditry terrorism in Niger State started. That's where these people started, and then from there they moved to Kaduna and other places. Now they have driven a lot of farmers out of their farms on Guada and other areas like, you know, around that Shiroro, that where you have the Shiroro power station. They've driven these farmers away. Why won't food prices be high? The roads, how are the, 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 do we have good road uh, interconnectivity? No. So the point is that we should talk to ourselves. We should make our nation more secure. We should make our nation better so that we don't have foreigners who come and sit in push hotels and be writing reports. Do they go to the farms? Ask them. How do they know that food prices will remain high? Do they go to the markets? Do they go to the farms? They just sit, they just appoint some people as um, um, advisors or resource persons. And those ones will go around, whatever they bring, how do you filter what these people say? You have the National Bureau of Statistics, but People, even government officials, have had reason to disagree with some of their, some of their, some of their statistics and some of their recommendations. Yeah. What we need is this: we need to get serious as a nation. We need. But our food price is not yes. high. They are high, of course. They have not just started going up. Food prices for more than the past, let's say, six to eight years, have been high. There have been times when Nupeng, National Union of Petroleum National and, and Natural Gas Workers, went on strike because why? They said the roads were bad. And their members were dying in accidents and were being killed by armed robbers. You've had such situations where truck drivers went on strike because they said the roads were bad. So that's a major problem. Then you now have banditry. You have banditry, you have cattle rustling, you have criminals going into the farms to kill. You, you also have the menace of headsmen going into the farms to kill farmers. And then farmers, they run away. Now that's why you see so many people, so many young people from other parts of the country going into a riding Okada. These are people that should be in farms. But because they cannot, they don't have a safe environment to farm, so they've run away from those places and come to Lagos, where, of course, they can ride Okada safely, move around and get, get some money, and uh, move, you know, move along with life, take care of their families, send some money back to their families. You see what is going on in Kaduna State and other places, kidnapping poor people and saying each person should bring 20 million naira. When they don't bring the money, you kill them. This is brigandage. And it is unfortunate that nobody has been punished for this. It's unfortunate. The National Security Advisor remains there, just talking, blowing hot air, telling us we will do this, we will do this, we will do this, we will do this. And all the pot shots are directed at the president because he's the commander-in-chief. But they will now tell you, okay, 
All right, the president has said so. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but what? If you know you don't have the right environment to work, then resign. Well, so that people are courageous to do the work. We'll, we'll get in there. Okay, let's um, bring in um, G.D. Johnson. We understand that we have him back um, on the line. Uh, G.D. Johnson, uh, thanks for staying with us. Uh, Justin, I've been following the conversation as well. Okay, so let's ha get some of your comment um, uh, from all that we have said so far. Well, on the on the ambassador call for state police now, I think it's appropriate. Nigeria is ready for it now. It's evidently clear that they will that we are ready for it. Um, telling us that there are food prices, there will be high in food prices. It's a global problem. It's not only in Nigeria. I'm not thinking, spoken about the hike in gas, gas prices, gasoline prices in the Western world with respect to the effect of the Russian Ukraine crisis. And it's only Africa they talk about. But if you look at what the make said, with respect to the challenge we have with Bani tree that has turned away the farmers, and with respect to um, the farmers' headers crisis we had, for many, many years, until we have been to a certain degree. And then the implications of COVID-19 lockdown. Everyone, you don't need rocket science for anyone to tell you that then there will be issues with, with respect to food, to food supply, coupled with the fact that we don't have good storage facilities. Our problem in Nigeria is not production. Our problem has to do with distribution and storage of these, of these um, food, Products that we that we have in our in our, in our country, so that's that's just my view. And that if we improve our transportation system, improve our logistics, improve our storage facility, and we deal with this challenging security issues that has taken away farmers away from the land, and so what I am saying will not obtain in Nigeria. All right, let's get back to the studio here where we have uh, Emeka. Madhu Nagu, who is here with us this morning. And uh, on the punch, we still get back to the punch. It talks about INEC to spend 239 billion naira on poor materials and presidential runoff. Uh, you also have INEC saying that, uh, you know, despite the insecurity situation, they are still going to go ahead. We also, there was a certain time where INEC came out to say, hey, we're not even sure about the 2023 elections if the insecurity situation persists, but you know, it's a different conversation right here. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. It's interesting in a season when um, nobody is paying attention to ASU, SANU and NASU, that preparations for elections are just going on smoothly, as if we are living in um, El Dorado. Yes, INEC is a statutory agency of government saddled with um, the conduct of electioneering and elections. All right, but politicians in Nigeria usually pander to their own interests. Whatever will favor their interests is where they put their minds, they, they avert their minds to. Now, elections are coming. You see all the preparations and everything going on. You will see towards the election, suddenly, it will be as if headsmen never existed, as if bandits never existed. Everywhere will just go calm. You now wonder where did all these people suddenly disappear to? You know, so it's as if they have a kind of a magic wand, you know, which they use on. You saw what Jonathan did now when he was president. He postponed the election. INEC postponed the election by six weeks. And suddenly Boko Haram was defeated and all of that. What we need <coughs> now is that when we are spending money on, ele on elections, we should also take into consideration social services, education, security, other areas. There are more pressing problems than elections. And again, I think the cost of our elections <coughs> have gone too high. Something needs to be done about the cost of electioneering and the conduct of elections in Nigeria. Because spending $239 billion, I, I, I wonder... I wonder how the nation copes with all these uh, with these huge budgets every election cycle. And don't forget, in between, you have elections in states and maybe some um, constituencies. So, the the point is that yes, INEC will do its duty because it's it, it has a constitutional role to play. 
But I think something needs to be done about the cost of holding elections in Nigeria. All right, uh, Judy, let's um, get your uh, comments concerning that Emeka has um, his mind uh, about um, the cost being too high and that um, the government should be focusing on other social issues. How do you reason? As I said, it could get them 239 million votes. Okay. For the presidential election. The last election, we were brought up with 30 million votes. Because, because you are making a projection. It's based on statistics, it's based on available data. In 2019, what was the total vote cast for the presidential election? In 2015, I'm not sure we have gotten to the threshold of 40 million in the last um, 20 years that we've had election. How can you jump statistically from less than 30 million? in four years to four to one hundred million and then if you look at the budget the budget was based on their projection so it's just wasted it's just an opportunity for them to just wait and just i have said it let them share this money to us and we share the money and then let them continue to rule just to look at the amount of money we have spent on election and the deliverables of the result you are getting from, from governance, you see that you have wasted public research. It would be better for us to spend this money for all the years that we waste, that we waste this money. But like any person, we don't care about us. Everything will work out fine once there is time for election. What is the difference between PDP and APC? And what business does the wife of the president has to invite? Presidential aspirant to attend. Any one of them that attend is not serious. One, because she does not have the power. Two, she does not have the moral right. She doesn't live in Nigeria. She's not in, as far as we are concerned, she's not a visitor to Nigeria. And all of a sudden, she came to Nigeria to invite them. That they should come and do what? And then they shouldn't come with their phone and the rest of it. Absolute nonsense. All right, uh, Gina Johnson, let's, let's stay with you, but this is on the Daily Independent. He talks about uh, the APC and the 100 million presidential foreign buyers saying they should be probed. I mean, this has gotten a lot of Nigerians talking, and some persons have said it's a party affair. The parties actually have the right to decide and you know do whatever it is that they chose to do. But it, it's really interesting, like we have stated. Sometime in 20, uh, 2014, uh, prior right. to 2015, it the president it was very concerned about, um, you know, this presidential ticket that was pegged at 27.5 million naira. And now you have the APC with 100. Are you saying that anyone who buys this form should be probed? What do you think? It is just the sheer hypocrisy of the APC and the APC in the federal government. Well, 100 million to 100 million protection of INEC voters. As you can see that it is. Why should someone pay 100 million to buy nomination for the political party? There are ways in which political parties could generate revenue because I've listened to some people that where do we expect the parties to make money to run their affairs and <laughs> However, at whose expense? Who can afford 100 million? Now, one of the things they've also done is to shut out people that do not have access to public funds to contest election. Let me break it down for you. Now, it's because you are looking at the presidential election. Let's start from the House of Assembly. Two million. Now, someone wants to aspire for the House of Assembly to represent his constituent, state for state. He's going to pay two million. Someone is going to have a rep. He's going to pay 10 million. Now, in Lagos State, you have 24 hours of rep members. 24, if you only have 24, <coughs> which you never, even if you know, have, let's say three times 24 as you are the Lagos, that's 72. 72 times 10 million. Now, the money goes to the National Secretariat and not the State Secretariat. There's something fundamental with the structure. It's not even about the money. There's something fundamental with the structure of our party system. 
And that is what is fundamentally wrong with, the, with governance in Nigeria. That is just my take. <laughs> much later and since we will be having you on that segment but let's look at some other issue that is uh, uh, giving me concern uh, right now it's uh, it's about mental health of nigerians uh, more nigerians getting mad the red cross is crying out what does this really tell you are they getting mad or they're getting <laughs> <laughs> that's well, that's that's well, we, well we need to you know there are dimensions of mental illness oh. um not necessarily um, about seeing people walking naked on the streets mm. or half clad on the streets. Um, a lot of people are actually suffering from depression because the times are hard, the economy is hard. So couples take out the tension on each other, you know, they take it out on their children. They, it, just imagine a young couple wanting to get married and the bill set before them. I mean, they have to take loans here and they may take them three to five years to pay off those loans. So you see those things could put pressure on them and yes, they get on, depressed. On, on, on another yes. level now, yes. that should they take all those loans just to get married? You see, these are two people love each other. What do you and want them to, to do? Go above their own means. You see, that's the problem with the funny things we value in our society. That if my children don't organize a lavish wedding, then ah, what will my friend say? What will my what will, what will my colleague say? What will my associate say? But we need to begin to cut down on a lot of things that put pressure on people, particularly the young ones. The youth constitute sixty percent of the population of Nigeria, and a lot of them are unemployed nowhere for them, no, nothing for them to do, and nobody cares about them. So what do you find? They have to find a way to get their hours, to make their hours productive, and they get into all kinds of things. Then <coughs> you have, NABRAC is now trying to cut down on the proliferation of alcoholic drinks, because these things harm the internal organs, even the brain. But you find out also NDLA is doing a lot in terms of, in terms of bringing down drug abuse. You just saw, which day was it that NDLA broke into a, hotel, a party somewhere in Abuja, a cannabis party. And some people were trying to bring out, to launch a psychoactive drink at that party. You even have cookies, cookies laced with drugs. Okay, so it's... Unfortunate that some people have not taken up the business of trying to run their fellow Nigerians into madness. mental illness. Not necessarily madness, you know, but you know, that's why I said there are stages of mental illness. Yes, the economic situation in the country, yes, people are depressed, loneliness and all of that. Those are, you know, that's one side of it. Then when couples lose their jobs, nine million people lost their jobs. Within between 2015, I mean the back-to-back -back recession we had in the country. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know that will put pressure on on people. Then look at domestic violence; it's another problem. That's an offshoot of what they are talking about. I mean, a man beating his wife for what? When you trace it, a lot of it boils down to finance. It's not as if it's justifiable, but these things are happening now. What is the government doing? Red Cross is an NGO, it's a non-government organization. It has pointed the way out, but you will see now government will come out to deny and say, no, 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 it's not that bad. You see, uh, we are doing this. What are you really doing? There must be programs to rehabilitate people. There must be policies. There must be policies. The major problem we have in Nigeria is not the absence of activity. You see government officials, they're always active. They're always busy around so many things. But where is the policy? What is what is the policy driving all these activities? No policy. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, when one government leaves, it's as if that government never did anything at all. Another government comes up. So every time they keep patching, they keep doing roads, roads, roads. What is the policy driving all those things? There must be a broad-based policy. Yes, NDLA is working, NABRAC is working, but those are just shots in the dark. There must be an all-encompassing policy, bringing these agencies together to say, wait a minute, we have a serious problem. Look at what Red Cross has put down. What are the things causing all this problem? How can we, at the federal, state, local government level, and even at the family level, how can we ensure 
that this thing does not go out of control. All right. Okay, uh, Jide Johnson, do you want to comment before we round off this session? Well then. Hello, Jide. Yeah, Dustin. Yes. The, I agree with the nephew in totality. I agree with him. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, G.D. Uh, Johnson. He's, uh, he's agreed to all that you have said uh, concerning uh, the issue of Nigerians uh, running uh, mad. Uh, G.D., just uh, before we round off uh, this uh, particular discourse, uh, there's a story on the uh, daily, uh, the leadership uh, Friday. Uh, it's still on the ASO strike. I just want to get your comment. I know we almost sound like um, broken records over this particular <laughs> issue, but strike ACF offers to mediate in federal government and ASU dispute. Do you think right now mediation is what that we should be uh, looking at or, or just what are the main profitable solutions to all of this so we can have a lasting solution on this ASU matter? GD. Just imagine if the federal government has devoted the same attention to the people elected. And the given the nuclear resources are available to IMF every now and then. And the nuclear ability to the particular sector. I'm not sure we have this fact that we are having now. It's just for us, all stakeholders, the federal government, national assembly, the ministries. And agencies in most of the people to pay attention to this, to give what is required for 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 the people sector because the good of our nation is tied to the investment that we put in our educational sector because the educational sector is where innovation, creativity that drives the economy comes from. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, G.D. Johnson, uh, uh, Chief uh, Lecturer, Nigeria Institute of Journalism, and of course, um, Emeka Madonagu. Uh, he is uh, also a publisher. He's a journalist as well, and uh, he's an analyst. Uh, he's still here with us. Uh, that's as much as we can take on this particular uh, discourse. But we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, we'll be looking at uh, the APC uh, neck meeting, all of the fallout from that, uh, the 100 million naira uh, nomination from and all the matters arising in a moment. Do join us again. <laughs>